I discovered the same things I thought were character flaws. When you see them in this new angle, when you're using them correctly, they're your greatest superpowers. You know, a huge part of human design is when you are using your energy correctly and doing this experiment we've been talking about with your strategy and authority, you naturally align with your purpose. Dana and Shana, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to dive in to all of the goodness that we're going to be talking about today. I know I just recently got to have a beautiful conversation with both of you on your incredible chart topping, massively popular podcast. Um, and so I would love for you to, for those in my world who have not heard of you or Day Luna to kind of share a little bit about what Day Luna is and how it was manifested. I'm going to use the word manifested because as you guys know, that's, that's where I go with that, but how it was manifested to come alive into the work that you now do with human design. Yeah. So Day Luna is our business and it's a business geared around teaching and empowering others around their authenticity and finding their purpose through human design. And, you know, the process of creating Day Luna where we get to share human design happens so organically. It almost felt like it happened to us and we were an active part of answering the call, but it was this very beautiful and magical and surprising journey um, that brought us here. So Shane and I have been best friends for a long time, for over 15 years. We went to college together and we were like dorm mates, you know, like roommates in our dorm. And uh, when we graduated college, we stayed really close friends. And at all of our friend group, Shane and I always just had this kinship, this connection. We felt like our energy was the same as each other and we experienced the world in the same way. And we felt really different than a lot of our other friends, but we never really knew why. So we had this kind of like soul sister connection. And after college, we graduated, we went out into the world and we're like, oh shit, we better get grown up careers because now we're on our own. So we both got corporate jobs and we found ourselves in these corporate jobs and we're working our way up and all of a sudden, when we turned about 27 years old, right before our Saturn return, which is a astrological transit that every person goes through when they're about 27 to 30, at that point, both of us just had this exhaustion, this complete burnout, just overwhelm us. And we would talk on the phone like, my job, like I did all these things and I've been promoted and they want me to go back to school and get my master's degree, but I can't, I can't do it. Like I'm exhausted. I'm depleted. And I feel like everyone else in my job is fine. Like what is wrong with me? Am I lazy? What's going on? And we were both having this experience at the same time in separate careers on different paths. So together as best friends, we're like, we got to get some answers because whatever this is, it's not it there's something missing, there's something off. We thought we were doing it right, but this is wrong. And so we started kind of soul searching together, getting into meditation and yoga and astrology. And along that path of exploring and discovering, we discovered human design. And when we did our charts in human design, we discovered that we are both two, four projectors. And out of the five human design types, projectors are one of the more rare. And then there's 12 different profiles, which is kind of like your personality archetype. And we're both two fours out of the 12. So it was this instant light bulb moment of recognition of, first of all, why we had always felt so connected, why we always felt like we were experiencing life in the same way and why maybe we were different than our other friends and why we just saw eye to eye on this really powerful level. That all clicked into gear, but also it clicked into gear of why working this you know nine to five job was just completely exhausting us when we're only 27 years old. We're supposed to be so full of energy and life. And we felt like we were you know scraping ourselves off out of our bed each morning to try to go into work. And so, you know, as projectors in human design, you are not someone who has consistent energy to work. Even when you're completely in love with what you're doing, you don't have that consistent energy. Projectors are really only here to work two to four hours a day of hard expending energy. And then the rest of the time they can be focused on brainstorming and laying down while they work and working on things that don't feel like they expend energy. But it was just this huge moment of discovering that we had been working wrong and also that we had been really off track with who we were 
authentically. And that's just this kind of like quarter life crisis of complete misalignment moment. So when we discovered human design, we decided, you know, we were just in this mode of exploring. We're like, okay, we're going to take our human design strategy and authority, and we're going to experiment with it every moment of every day for the next month. Like we're going to go hard and we're going to hold each other accountable. And every single night after that, we like talk on the phone until four o'clock in the morning. Like, this is what I experienced today. What did you experience? And all of these aha moments. And in that one month of experimenting with our human design, everything in our lives began to change. We had so much clarity around our old jobs and why they weren't a fit for us. And, you know, all of the kind of bitterness that we had been feeling there because we had been misusing our energy. And we started really getting clear on what we wanted to say no to, the things that we wanted to start weeding out of our lives. And that led to this long process of, new invitations coming in, which as a projector, your strategy is being invited. And once we started using our energy more correctly and saying no to things that were exhausting us and following our fascinations, invitations were flooding in left and right. And those invitations ended up being like a map of breadcrumbs. You know, we started following the ones that felt exciting and juicy and that started leading to more. And eventually down that path, we got invited to start giving human design readings. We got invited to create products to help people learn about their human design. We got invited to start a podcast. And all of those things were things that we never thought we would do. But as the invitation came in, it was like the universe knocking on your door and using that inner authority and really trusting your own intuition about what's right for you we just answered those calls and showed up together as best friends. And that led to creating De Luna, creating this whole kind of umbrella of a business where we get to use human design to create this business that then gets to teach and empower others with it. It was a really fun an expansive journey. And now we've had De Luna for about four years, four and a half years. We've written a book. We train other people to become human design readers. Um, we just feel so grateful for this journey and the way that it unfolded and how easy it was to navigate those challenges and to you know, create that inner strength and that inner courage when you are truly being authentic and you have these tools of knowing how to make an aligned decision and knowing how to become your own inner authority on navigating that path. Oh, so, so good. Okay. So I want to back up a little bit because if there's someone listening that has never heard of human design and they're just like, oh my gosh, whatever this thing is, is amazing. And I want it. Can we start and give us a little bit of a cliff notes of what is human design at its core? And then I would love for you guys to kind of break down the different types And then if there's someone listening, I know that you have a link of where someone can go input their information to get their human design, if we can share that. And then I've got some other questions, but we'll start there. Yeah. So if you've never pulled up your human design chart before, you can do so for free online anywhere. You can use our chart software, which is free at daylunalife.com. And you need your birth information, your birth date, time, and location to pull up this blueprint of your energetic body, basically. And human design is a synthesis of ancient sciences and modern current sciences. So it uses Western astrology, the Chinese I Ching, the Kabbalah Tree of Life, and the chakra system. And it weaves all of that together to show you how your unique energetic body operates and interacts with the world around you. And then it also pulls in information from the moment you're born and three months before you're born when your consciousness comes into the womb. So it gets really technical and it looks at your genetics and your DNA and also these other systems like astrology and the chakra system. Um, So Human design is the most complex system that we've come across to really reflect back to you. This is who you are. This is what makes you unique. This is what makes your energy operate in flow versus resistance. And having this language to understand these energetics that you've always felt is powerful. Anyone that hears about their human design, it's this feeling of coming home like, oh my gosh, I've always felt that, but I just didn't know that that was consistent or special or unique. And so that's kind of the 
purpose of human design is to give you languaging to understand yourself more. So that way you can start operating in a way that serves you. So if you think of your energetic body, like this vehicle or car going down the road, a lot of times you can feel like, okay, I don't know where I'm going, or I'm just on autopilot. And human design really tells you, okay, you are a hybrid, so you need this type of fuel, or you're electric, or you're diesel. It's telling you what kind of gas you need for your car and how to drive your car so you're not just driving blind in the dark. And I think, you know, for me, I was told my whole life, just be yourself, just be who you are. And I, always would be like, okay, great, but how? Like, who am I? I have no idea. (laughs) I would love to do that, but have no idea where to start. And so having this languaging was the first time in my life where I felt, oh my gosh, I, I now understand what it means to be myself and how I can then use this every single day. So the great thing about human design is that it's not just offering you reflection and insight. It's also giving you tools to start applying this system and honoring your energy each and every day. And we call these these two main factors in your design, your strategy and your authority. So your strategy is how you are interacting day to day with other people. And your authority is how you can consistently rely on yourself to make decisions, these big decisions that are going to alter the course of your life. So Having these two practical tools really is the thing that Dana and I applied for that month that changed our life because you now are showing up and honoring your energy in a way that's serving you versus working against the grain or swimming upstream, which most of us are doing. Because when you are comparing yourself to your boss or your friends or your parents or your colleagues and saying, oh, that worked for them, so let me try it or they must be better than me, or I'm, you know, not as good or as talented or as worthy, or that judgment can creep in. It's coming from a place of not having awareness of how you're different and how you're unique and who you actually are. So once you have those tools, you stop comparing yourself. You start focusing more on who you are and what works for you and what your gifts are without trying to strive to be like others around you. And you release that judgment where you're kind of beating yourself up every day, which is draining your energy constantly. So those two parts, releasing comparison and judgment, kind of set you free to then start really honoring your energy more and more each day. And we like to say human design is an experiment. The more that you experiment with it, the more you kind of prove to your mind like, oh, this works. And your mind can get on board to let your body start leading you versus your mind trying to compare and judge and call the shots all the time, contrive things. So there's five different energetic types or energetic cars, if you will, if we're going with that analogy. And um, everyone falls into these five types. And these are the most broad categories in human design. And then it gets more specific and more specific from there. So when you first pull up your chart, you're going to see this energetic body with all these shapes and lines and numbers and colors. And it can feel like, okay, I have no idea what this means, but you'll also see these categories written on the right hand side and you'll see your name and then you'll see your type. And that will either say manifester, generator, manifesting generator, which is what you are, Julie, projector, which is what Dana and I are, or reflector. And that's the perfect place to start because that's going to give you your strategy that is appropriate for you to use your energy each day. So Dana, do you want to talk about these different uh, strategies and energetic types? Yeah. So the first type that we want to talk about are manifestors. Now, manifestors are more rare. They're less than 10% of the population. And manifestors have this powerful aura that is closed. So they're really here to be impactful. Little things they say and do are amplified by this powerful aura that they have, and they leave an impact. So their energy, the things they say, the things they do end up initiating other people and acting like a catalyst for change. Now, they also have this 
this closed aura to protect them from outside influence because they really are here to do what they feel called to do. They're here to be really independent. They're here to have that freedom. They are not here to be swayed by other people. They are here to be a fire starter and a trailblazer and an innovator. And even if they're not creating or doing anything currently, little things they say still end up being this huge catalyst and this huge impact in other people's lives. And they still end up innovating just from saying hello to someone in the grocery store or like one little comment that they say because they have this powerful aura that really amplifies the things that they say and do. So for a manifester, it's so important that they get to have the freedom to create new things and start new things, but they don't necessarily have the consistent energy to finish what they started. So it's important for them to let other people in and to allow other people to help them complete their projects or to pass their projects off when they get bored and they want to start something new. And in order to really have all of that kind of flow there with other people understanding what they're wanting and getting on board, they need to use their strategy of informing So because they have this closed aura, they're so impactful, but they're also kind of unpredictable. And that can be sort of a recipe for resistance from other people because the things that they say and do impact them so much, but it's kind of scary. Like, what are they going to say and do next? Because whatever it is, I know it's going to impact me. So if the manifestor starts to inform and to use their voice to just vocalize what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're bored of, what they're wanting to do next with radical authenticity. It opens up a window in their closed aura and it creates so much more ease. People feel like, okay, I'm on board. I hear what you're wanting to do. And even they might want to support you and your energy is so powerful. It rallies energies in, in other people to want to get on board and help you complete your projects. So as a manifester, start experimenting with that strategy of informing just sharing what's on your mind. And it is worth noting that for manifestors, they're the only type of the five types that it feels completely foreign to use this strategy. It feels like the last thing on planet earth you want to do is let people in on what you're feeling. But once you start experimenting with that, you see how much ease it creates energetically and how much people are wanting to support your freedom and your independence when you are informing. The next type are generators and generators are more common. They're over 35% of the population and generators have this powerful aura that is designed to envelop other people and spread energy, this inclusive, warm, enveloping energy. So their aura is meant to include people in and whatever they're excited about and whatever they're lit up by, they end up then spreading that lit up, juicy life force energy to the people around them. As a generator, the most important thing is that you're using your energy each day on things that you love on things that light you up because that allows your aura to feed other people and to inspire and uplift others. Now, when a generator is not doing something that they love and they're sacrificing their energy and they're working a job that they don't like, they really dwindle this powerful life force energy they have and they stop spreading this positive uh, and vitalizing energy to other people. So as a generator, you have this consistent amount of energy. It's like each day you wake up with a fully charged battery And it's so important that you use that energy doing things that are actually satisfying for you, doing things that you actually want to do. But because they have this open aura, people feel comfortable asking a generator to sacrifice themselves for others. So many generators find themselves in a people-pleasing mode, sacrificing their energy because they do have this consistent amount of energy doing something they don't want to do so they can help other people, so they can nourish other people, and they completely deplete their own battery. And then that is really kind of the opposite of what they're here to do. They're here to be charged up and then to be spreading that juicy life force sparkle to other people. So in order for a generator to find what it is that lights them up, to find how they're meant to use their energy, what they're meant to use their energy on each day, they practice their strategy of responding, responding with their body. So what this means is as a generator moves through life, and they bump into things in their external environment, their body gets this response to that thing. And if their body responds with this energy and excitement and enthusiasm, like the engine is just on, like, ooh, I want to dive into that thing, that thing is right for you. It's aligned for you to use your energy on this thing. Whereas if you bump into something and your body feels like, meh, 
I could take it or leave it. Or even like exhausted, like, oh, I don't want to go to this party or I don't want to answer, answer this email. That energetic response in your body, that lack of energy, is actually your body indicating to you that this thing is not correct for you to use your energy on. So as a generator, responding is about being present and starting to listen to your body's responses to things and to trust that that is your truth. Now, your mind might be telling you, you have to go to this party because it's your boss's party and they you want them to like you and whatever, X, Y, and Z. But just starting to know that as a generator, your body's responses is your true inner compass. That is going to guide you to your purpose. That is going to guide you to your abundance. That is going to guide you to the place where you're the most um, effervescent, where you give off this amazing energy that charges up and inspires the world around you. So now the third type is manifesting generator. And as it sounds, it's sort of like a hybrid, a blend of these first two types that we've talked about. So at the end of the day, a manifesting generator still is a generator. They're someone who has this consistent amount of energy and they are here to use it, doing what they love, building what they love, creating what they love. And like the manifester, a manifesting generator is here to inspire and to be innovate and to be a trailblazer and to do things in a new way, to build things that are going to inspire and impact others and be different than anything that's ever created before. So they have this aura that is open and enveloping and that's here to charge other people up and inspire other people when you're lit up by what you're doing. And you have this aura that's here to initiate others. The things that you say and do leave a big impact. People are impacted by the things that you say. It moves them and it becomes a catalyst for change and growth in their own life. So manifesting generators have big energy, powerful energy. The main difference between a manifesting generator and a generator is that a generator is a bit more singular in their focus and in their energy use. Whereas a manifesting generator gets bored easily. They're designed to be super efficient. They master things quickly. So they need diversity and variety in the way that they're using their energy each day. If a manifesting generator is like doing one thing every day on someone else's schedule, they have the energy to do it for a bit, but it's going to drain their battery. It is going to be so boring for them because they need to be challenged. They need to be excited and enthusiastic about what they're doing. So it's important that they have the freedom to bounce around from task to task and to have that variety and diversity. And also knowing that they're here to do things in a different way than anyone else. So if you're a manifesting generator, big permission slip to just trust that whatever is truly exciting and enlivens your body, just go for it. And don't worry if it makes sense on paper, I put in quotes, because you're here to be that trailblazer. So the strategy for manifesting generators is to respond just like a generator, responding to the things around you, listening to your body's reaction to things. Does your body get turned on and excited and enthusiastic and lit up? that's a yes for you. Um, and if it's anything less than that, if it's a mediocre, if it's a blase, if it's a drudging through the mud feeling that you get in reaction to something, that's your body saying no for now, right? Don't work on this thing at this moment. And also manifesting generators need to inform because they are so powerful. They do initiate and impact other people and they can change their mind really quickly and have a lot of stuff going on at once. The more that they inform with other people, the more easily people are willing to get on board and to support all of the expansive things that they get to do. The next type projectors is what Shane and I are, are less than 20% of the population. Now projectors have an aura that is designed to penetrate into another being, to see into them deeply and to focus on the other so that they can see the other and then give advice or guidance and guide the energy use of the other. So projectors are really designed to guide others. And in order for them to give that insight or that advice and have it be received, that advice needs to be wanted, right? So when projectors try to give unsolicited advice, it goes really awry and it can cause their not self theme of bitterness. They're really here to wait for other people to recognize their wisdom and to, to energetically be open to and wanting that advice. And when that invitation is there, um, then projectors can be extremely powerful guides. They can guide other people to their highest authenticity, to their highest efficiency. Projectors are so great at seeing systems and businesses and 
offering advice and tweaks to make those things better and more efficient. So as a projector, you are what we call a non-energy being. It means that you have an inconsistent amount of energy. So you're not really able to work consistently every day, you know, 40 hours a week. Projectors are really designed to only work two to four hours a day of hard energy expending output. And then the rest of the time, they're here to be brainstorming and following things that fascinate them and ideally working from a laying down position in their ca- on their couch. But as a projector, that's the main thing is just making sure that you're not overworking and exhausting yourself um, and giving yourself that space so that you can really guide the energy use of others. And then that strategy to experiment with is waiting for the invitation. And what you do while you're waiting, you focus on making sure you're not exhausting yourself and focus on your fascinations, focus on your zone of genius, focus on the way that you see the world differently than anyone else. And the more you're really kind of tuned in with your skill set and your your genius on how you want to guide other people, if you're letting people see that, then they can recognize you, they can invite you, and then you can share that advice with others in a way that flows really effortlessly and really symbiotically. And then the last time type is reflectors. Reflectors are less than 1% of the population. So they are like our human design unicorns. And reflectors are individuals who have this aura that is extremely empathetic. They are completely taking in the energy of the world around them and the people around them, and then experiencing that energy in their own being. So reflecting the energy around them, embodying the energy around them temporarily, and even amplifying that energy. So reflectors have this really powerful purpose of being like this temperature gauge because they walk into a room, they take in that energy, they temporarily become that energy, and then they're able to discern, is this energy I've taken in healthy and authentic? or not. So we're really here to look to our reflectors to see how are we as a collective doing? Are we healthy? Are we authentic? Or are we not? Um, And as a reflector, you know, because you're so open, you're taking the world in so deeply, you're like this chameleon. You can become everything and then empty that out and become nothing. And reflectors are constantly changing because of that. Every day they're here to ask themselves, who am I today? What do I feel within me today? They're here to explore that, but then let that go and allow themselves to continue taking new things in and shape-shifting with their energy. So for a reflector, in order to really move through the world with the least resistance, your strategy is waiting a 28-day lunar cycle before you make any big decisions. Now, the reason for that is because each and every single new day, you're becoming this new energy based on the cosmic energy and the people around you. So if you have a big life decision, you need that time to cycle through all of the different ways that you can feel about it, all of the different things within you, and explore that until you find this complete clarity. So reflectors operate on a different time scale than the rest of the world. They need to slow down, give themselves a lot of time to explore each day until they get that clarity. And that's how they move through the world as their true self instead of just a smoke mirrored reflection of the world around them. So I know that there's a lot there. We could talk about each one of those types for an hour easily, but as you're listening, you know, knowing which type you are, the big takeaway is start experimenting with that strategy and just see how it feels. Feels. See if it creates more ease in your relationships. See if things start to come more easily to you. New opportunities or new invitations, you know, depending on your design, start to come more easily when you are experimenting with that strategy. Oh, it's such an amazing breakdown. And I have so many questions. I was laughing just now when you were talking about the reflector because my husband's a reflector. And so there'll be something going on. He's like, I just don't know. And then I'm over here. I'm like, sacral says no. Sacral says no. <laughs> but I'm like, that's for me. So like, I have to let him go through his lunar cycle before he gets there. Or I'm like, sacral says yes. This is a yes, but he needs to like process. And so with that said, I think it is, it's about really tapping into what what is going to move you and really support you. And so I love how you broke that down and, and shared it. And I would love to know, cause you were like really focusing on that strategy um, of, you know, how someone can kind of root into that. So we talked about the energy types. We talked about the strategy. We talked a little bit about the authority and how that plays in. There's so many other things. I mean, there's like your environment, the incarnation cross, the, the signature. You also talked about the not self 
theme for a moment. So is there is there one other piece that we could kind of touch on um, to kind of share for the different types of of what could kind of help people like if they wanted to go through like a 30 day test like you both did to like really see some changes other than understanding their type and understanding their strategy? What's like one other thing that they could that they could tap into? Yeah. So definitely it would be leaning into your authority next. So, you know, if you're listening to this and and hearing those five different types and resonating with maybe more than one as you're listening, it's because we all have so many nuances within our energy, right? So your strategy is really telling you, yes, you might be here to guide. You might be here to impact and create, and you might be here to really empathetically feel the world around you like a reflector. We all have these different nuances within us where the places that are open in our chart, even though we're a manifesting generator, we are reflecting the world around us in those white or open centers. So we have a part of us that is chameleon-like, like the reflector. And you also can be a manifester or a manifesting generator or generator and have projected gifts where you have a lot of qualities that are here to guide the energy use of others and make things more efficient and make things better and lead people into a better way of doing things. So we all have these sides of us that um, are a little bit reflectory and a little bit projectory and a little bit manifestory. And that's beautiful, right? But understanding, okay, for me, I go about achieving my goals with the least resistance when I, as a projector, focus on my fascinations and let people see and recognize me. So having a space where people can see me like Instagram or social media or a podcast or a platform for people to even recognize me to invite me. And then I can use my authority, whether that's a yes or a no for me. Right. And then same, similarly with being a manifesting generator, it's knowing, okay, yes, I'm here to guide and I'm here to impact, but how do I get there with the least resistance? It's that strategy of responding of, okay, what's actually in front of me right now? Does my body have energy towards this or not? Do I feel like I'm drudging through the mud? If so, can I put something else in front of my body and check in to see if I have energy? So pull up a different email, pull up a different tab on your computer, go stand in front of your fridge, go look at your car and literally feel until you feel like, ooh, I have energy to go hop in my car and go for a drive. That is letting your body lead you versus your mind of what should I do? What do, pe- what do people need me to do? People pleasing, like Dana was saying. So Using your strategy really looks like um, starting to tune into your body in these different ways. For man gens and generators, what's in front of me right now? How does my body feel? Can I listen? And for projectors, what's fascinating to me? Can people see me being authentic and focused on those fascinations? For manifestors, really informing, even when it feels uncomfortable, saying out loud in the morning, three things you're grateful for. And in the evening, three things you want to change and three things that you loved about that day. That's informing. That's telling the universe, I want more of this. I want less of that. Um, There's small ways that you can lean into informing. And for reflectors, really focusing on clearing out and asking, who am I today? And letting it change, letting it shift, not holding on to who you were yesterday or last week, but instead saying, you know what, today I'm feeling emotional. I'm going to go for a walk and let myself listen to sad music and cry. Like, great. Let yourself do that and flow with it. And then tomorrow you're going to be someone new. So that's strategy, right? Moving through your day. And then the next major core thing is making decisions that are energetically correct for you. And that's your authority. There's eight different authorities. Basically what this is telling you is when you have a big decision, there's a consistent way for you to access your truth with that decision. Now, this doesn't have to be applied to small things, although for some uh, to different types it can be, um, like for you, Julie, for example. But basically running through these authorities, half the population approximately has emotional authority. And this is where you are designed to give yourself time to slow down and to ride out your emotions until you come to an emotionally neutral place. 
So if you have emotional authority, it means that you create an emotional wave where you can wake up on the right side of the bed for no reason or the wrong side of the bed for no reason. And you still have reactionary emotions where something good happens to you. You're happy, something bad, you're sad, but you also have these random emotions that you're, are bringing you towards understanding life more deeply and feeling life more, but they can color your truth. So if you're in a high emotionally, you're more likely to say yes to something. If you're in a low emotionally, you're more likely to say no. So giving yourself time a day up to a week to really make sure you are emotionally neutral and then asking yourself, will this make me happy? Do I have this, like, when I picture myself doing this, do I have this happy, sweet smile coming to my face? Like, I just feel happiness within my body. That is a yes for you. If you feel like, eh, I could, it's whatever, it's blah, that's a no for now. And those are always the dangerous things because a lot of times when we feel like it's fine, then it's not bad, it's good. Might as well do it. But really saying no to anything that's not like that sweet, happy emotion. And then if you feel less of yourself, exhausted, obviously that's a no, right? But give making sure that you're neutral before you're checking in there is the key. And then about the other half of the population are designed to make decisions spontaneously. And that is you, Julie, going with that gut decision, that first thing you feel, that hell yes or hell no. And anything in between is a no for now. So Knowing that alone, that half the population is designed to give themselves time and the other half is designed to trust that first gut thing, that's huge because for without awareness, you could be telling somebody who has emotional authority, just trust your gut, trust what you feel, go with that first thing. But for them, they might be in a high or a low that's coloring their truth and they're not actually accessing their truth and vice versa. You might have emotional authority and you're telling someone with sacral authority, give your, give yourself time, sleep on it. Don't make a rash decision. And that then pulls them from their truth. And now they're confused and like, well, what did I feel? And I don't know. And now it feels harder to make that decision. So understanding how you're different and making decisions is, is so, so important, but There's emotional authority, there's sacral authority, which is trusting your gut, that first thing that you feel, being spontaneous. Then there's splenic authority, which is all about trusting your instincts, your intuition, that small kind of whisper. It's similar to sacral authority in that it's in that present moment, but splenic authority is a little bit subtler and more nuanced. It's not about the energy in your body and that like every cell of me is lit up like sacral authority is. It's more of this, it just feels right or something just smells right about it, or just smells off, or just feels off. That's splenic authority. Then there is G-Center authority, which is what I have, which is all about using your voice and speaking out loud to understand what it is that you want, what it is that you is on your path or is in your purpose. So for me, I kind of have this mumbo jumbo of thoughts going on all the time in my head. And when I speak, it becomes linear for me to understand what it is that I actually want. So talking out loud every day to the universe, to my friends, to my family, having people that I can soundboard off of to hear what it is that I want, what my truth actually is. A lot of people with G-Center authority or self-projected authority is what it can be called can feel like they don't want to be a burden and and talk and share to other people. And they can actually bottle that up and not speak at all. Um, And that's keeping them from their truth. And then they're just making decisions from a place of their mind of what should they do? What are people needing from them? What makes the most sense? But if you can open your voice and just start talking out loud and seeing what feels like is on your path, because this is coming from your G center, which is a place of your soul and your path, you'll have crystal clear clarity over something that you've been mulling over for weeks in your mind. Um, And then there's ego projected and ego manifested. This is coming from the ego center. And this is really asking, what do I want? What do I deserve? What's in it for me? And this is where you are designed, if you have this authority to be, I put in quotes, enlightenedly selfish and really ask like, what am I getting out of this? And is this serving me? Is this benefiting me? Because if it is, then it's in the best benefit for everyone else involved. And if it's not, then it's not aligned for everyone else involved. So 
every single person that we've met, we've done thousands and thousands of readings at this point that have ego authority. They are the most selfless, caring, nurturing, giving people you could ever meet. And so it is really hard to, to say, okay, what's in it for me? Because they have this heart that just wants to give and motivate and support other people. So stopping and saying, okay, what's in it for me? If you're a manifester with this, it's about unediting your voice and just blurting out whatever that first thing comes to you. And then following that up with like, so what am I getting out of this? And you're going to hear crystal clear what it is that you deserve. And then if you're a projector with this, this authority, it's about really asking what's in it for me. You can talk it out loud, but you don't have to, you can just sense like this is honoring my worth or it's not. And then the next one is mental slash environmental authority, which if you have this, it means you're a projector and on your chart, it's going to say no inner authority. And this really means that you, your body is picking up a lot of information from the environment around you. So this has two sides of it, where this is the only authority where you are designed to use your mind and look at what all of the numbers, the pros and cons, um, really get things on the drawing boards and look at what makes sense, what doesn't, and then set that aside and go to your favorite environments, your favorite coffee shop, your favorite lookout, your favorite part of your home or your Zen den, um, a park. And when you are in these environments that you've cultivated that just feel good to you, that feel healthy, you are then amplifying that energy from that environment and it can kind of settle these things that are in your mind down into your body and you get this clarity of this just feels right or it doesn't. And you it might take going to a few different environments for that clarity to drop in and kind of sift through to drop in for you or it's time to go back to the drawing board. Like, let me really look at that email again. Let me really research some things, get that mental clarity and then set it aside go to those environments till it drops in of this just feels right. I just know. And then lastly, there's lunar authority, which this is only for reflectors. And this is giving yourself that 28 days to make a big decision. So you don't need to give yourself a month to go have lunch with a friend, but really if it's important to you, right? Like that might be an important decision for you with that specific friend, give yourself time. So really asking, is this important to me or not? And that's going to be relative because for some people buying a house is really important. And for other people, it's not. So asking, is this an important decision for me? And if so, let me check in with myself every day and how I feel with it and let that answer shift and change, not holding on to what I felt the day before. And throughout that month, that 28 days, you're going to be sifting through all of these different authorities where some days you're going to have a gut feeling about it. The next day you might have an intuition about it. The next day you might want to talk about it with friends and family and bounce it off and hear what's on your path. And then the next day you might need to go to different environments and you're getting clarity from this coffee shop that you're in. And really you're going through all of these different authorities throughout that month until you've sifted through all of it. And at the end, you can have this clarity of, I just know this is right for me or this is wrong for me. And if you don't have that clarity, give yourself another month. Um, it's a no for now. So that can sound like, how is that possible? But every reflector that we've met, it just happens naturally where it's like, I was thinking about you know getting married and I've been thinking about it for months now. And I just have this knowing, this this knowing of it just feels right. Whereas we've also met a lot of man gens or generators who are like, I'm getting married tomorrow. Let's go to Vegas. And so knowing that that spontaneity is supportive for you, it's right for you if you have that sacral authority or that splenic authority. And a lot of times out of love for other people, we try to tell people what works for us to help them. Like this worked for me. So this is what's going to work for you. But we don't know how unique and different we are. We might be derailing someone from their truth. And, you know, the last few authorities that I talked about are really rare, right? They're not the majority of the, po the population. The majority of the population has emotional authority, giving yourself that time emotionally neutral or sacral or splenic authority, which is all about in that present moment, really trusting yourself. So if you find on your chart, which one you are, I encourage you 
to set an amount of time, like one week and say, okay, for this one week, I am going to use my strategy and really start interacting with the world in this way, listening to my body in this way that applies to me. And then any medium decision that comes across my plate and big decisions, if you're, if you're really wanting to dive into this and give it a go, I'm going to use my specific authority and trust myself. I'm going to see if that worked out for me or if it didn't. And that might look like for the first week or few weeks saying no more than you're saying yes. Like you're not getting a hell yes in your body. You're getting like a, I could, that's a no for now. And I would encourage you say no more and take some of your energy back. And you might feel bad. You might feel guilty, but you'll see how that creates more alignment for you and for the other people involved until something comes across your plate that you're like, hell yes. Like I have so much energy for that. And you can feel the difference so crystal clear and see how it serves you so much more than putting your head down and just mustering through things or people pleasing, et cetera. So those are the two places to start. I know that was so much information and it's so hard to wrap up these incredibly complex different parts of a chart into like one slew of, <laughs> of information. But I would encourage you look at your type, your strategy and authority Take these tidbits that we've talked about here today and start experimenting, set amount of time, like one week, two weeks, one month, and see how it starts to shift and change things in your life. Well, and can you remind people again, the link where they can go to? Yeah. So you can go to daylunalife.com and pull up your free chart. And that's going to show you everything that we've talked about here today. We also have a podcast where we dive into each one of these topics um, for hours because it's so complex, right? Human design is human design. So it's just as complex and intricate as we are as humans. And we're all so incredibly unique with the combination of things that we have in our chart. So understanding how you are different from your friends and families and colleagues is the first place to start honoring that. And then it gets fun because you get to see, oh, and my partner's this and my best friend's that. And that's why we're so different. And there's nothing wrong with me or wrong with them. We just are serve, like meant to operate in different ways. Yeah. And I think that's like when I learned like my children's charts and then when I learned my husband's and the fact that he was a reflector, it allowed me to give him so much more grace and compassion with like not being able to make decisions as quickly as I could or not being like, I know because I know, but like yeah. he doesn't necessarily know because he knows in that moment, you know, and so <laughs> yes. I did, you know, learning that for yourself, even if it's just kind of, you know, conceptually can be really helpful. And as you said, like it is so nuanced and there's so many layers to this, which I know is not only do you have the podcast for that, but you also wrote a book and that is such a great blueprint and roadmap for people who want to dive into not only their own energy type and strategy and authority and, and signature and, you know, their incarnation cross and their profiles and all the things, but it will also give you a really good uh, roadmap for others as well. So can you share a little bit about the book and, um, you know, why that will be a good resource for people who want to dive deeper into this? Yeah, here it is. Here's our book. She's gorgeous. Um, it's called Your Human Design. And yeah, Dana, you want to dive into this creation? I mean, you know, since you wrote a book as well, it's, it's like your it's baby. Yeah, it is like uh -huh. a baby. And our whole intention with this book, we wanted it to be like your guidebook. So you can refer back to it and look at all it tell, you know, it takes you through the whole thing. So if you're brand new to human design, this is a great book for you. It shows you how to generate your chart, how to look at the different numbers, because we know that human design is a bit overwhelming and we're on a mission to make it easy, to make it approachable and super deep and inspiring. We wrote this book as a guidebook to help you walk through the levels of experimenting with your design and to embody that experiment, to embody the energies here. So we We've done readings for thousands and thousands of people, and we'd really like to see how do we communicate this in a way that lands for us, where we can start practicing it instead of it just being this theoretical thing that now we're not exactly sure how to apply. And we've also seen out of all of the people that have these 
aspects of their design, what really works for them? What were the practices that they were doing? What was the question that they asked that brought them to their truth? So we've kind of done all of the deep soul searching and the expansive soul searching in human design. And then we really tried to boil it down and simplify it. And in the book, it also gives you a lot of tools for integration. So there's, um, you know, essential oils that can help you kind of connect with different parts of your body and get help you into that embodiment and get out of your mind a bit. There's journal prompts and there's quiz is. So you can find the book anywhere where books are sold. You can find it on Amazon or on Barnes and Noble. It's called Your Human Design. And I think it's a really great resource. You know, when we talk about human design, it's so wordy. Even just talking about on this podcast, there's obviously people who really love learning that way. And it's like, give me all the information. I could listen to stories about it all day. But also sometimes just having a simplified piece of writing that you can refer back to. You can keep it on your nightstand. You can go back like, what was my authority again? What am I checking in with again? Um, It's just a really supportive and grounding tool to be able to remind yourself that you're the authority of this journey. You're the person that feels the energetics of what true alignment and authenticity is. But human design is such a brilliant mirror to see that clear reflection and to get that validation, that permission, to get that roadmap so that you remind yourself like, oh yeah, I got this and I I can navigate these energetics. Yeah. I think that that is, that is the key to it. It's about how can I make this applicable to my life and to my business and to my relationships and to how I really navigate the world, because that's how we're going to be able to see the change. And even, you know, little things like I remember when in my chart, my digestion is nervous touch. And I was Mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, it makes sense. Like growing up, my mom would be like, why can't you just sit down and eat? And it's like, cause I'm not (laughs) supposed to be sitting down when I eat. I'm supposed to be like buzzing around and moving around. And so it's like, I think to learning, going deeper with your human design and learning about it in an applicable way, which the book lends to, it allows you to have, I think more permission to step into your authenticity and to, to be okay with just being who you are. And that, that little of example of just how I eat, if I would have never learned my human design, I would have always have thought that like, maybe something was wrong with me because I don't want to sit down and like have a meal. I just want to like grab and go and walk around and do my thing while I'm eating. And so yeah. it's, it's little things like that, that I think are so key and so important when you're diving into human design. And that's why I think the book is such a great roadmap and blueprint for people who want to dive in deeper to this. Before we wrap up, I would love to know what has been the biggest thing that has surprised you about yourself that you've learned from human design? Oh, Mm. that's a really interesting question. I think, um, you know, something for me being a projector, I have always waited for the invitation naturally. So I've always felt like I am not going to text that friend first if I don't know them really well. Like it's just my natural inclination. And I really judged myself for that Um, because so much of our messaging is like, get out there and make yourself known. And, and obviously it is extremely important for projectors to put themselves out there and for, to allow people to see them, but it's just with different energetics in the way, than the way I was taught. So giving myself permission to let people come to me um, and the fact that that was something I judged myself for, I literally thought it was a character flaw. And then I discovered the same things I thought were character flaws. When you see them in this new angle, when you're using them correctly, they're your greatest superpowers. So I think for me, that's like the kind of basic foundational level. That was really a huge thing for me. But I also wanted to say that you know, a huge part of human design is when you are using your energy correctly and doing this experiment we've been talking about with your strategy and authority, you naturally align with your purpose. And your human design chart can tell you a lot about your purpose with specificity in different areas, you know, like with your gates and your incarnation cross and your channels, which all of that is in the book as well. But you naturally align with your purpose when you are using your energy correctly. And that discovering my purpose, just finding myself as an embodiment of it because of just saying yes to who I really am. Um, It was both the biggest surprise and also like remembering and coming back home to something that is so familiar in my soul. But I think when I was young, I was really scared. Like, what if I never find success? What if I never find my thing? What if I never make an impact in the world? And that felt really daunting. So the fact that 
by just starting to navigate life as my true self and to trust my inner authority when choosing my you know choices on my life path, just doing that, aligning to my truth and finding the success that I have has been the greatest gift and also the greatest surprise um, in my life. And that's why I just feel so fired up and so passionate wanting to help other people have that experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with everything you just said. I mean, for me, um, I think the biggest surprise with human design was my authority, um, having G center authority because it is so rare to have, um, that nobody in my life that I know even still is, has the same authority as me. And so when I was younger and in college, I really felt like a burden to other people because I was constantly asking people's advice and wanting, and I didn't know that it was me trying to exercise like my soundboarding and bouncing off of people. And people would tell me like, I don't know, just, just make a decision, like figure it out. Like, Mm -hmm. why do you need my opinion? It's like, well, I don't really need your opinion. I'm just trying to get my clarity on what I want. And the, the first, one of the first things that I learned with this authority was that a lot of times the first thing that I say is not actually what I want or what I need. I'm just getting warmed up. It's like the start of the road, but it's not the end point. (laughs) And so knowing that was huge because a lot of times I would say, I don't want this thing. And then I'm talking, talking, talking at the end. I'm like, actually, I really do. And here's why. (laughs) And I felt so much confusion before I knew this because I felt like I'm just a confused soul or I don't know what I want, or I'm a mess, or I'm bipolar, I'm all over the place. And now that I know this, it's like, oh no. So I'm just talking out loud here. I don't even know if I mean this or want this, but this is what I'm feeling and blah, 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 blah. And then I get to the end and I'm like, this is what exactly what I want. And now that I know that I have such more permission to channel actually. And when I'm meeting with clients or when I'm um, facilitating retreats or spaces um, or containers, online classes, things like that, I, I allow myself to just be present and channel through, through all of my open centers, because I have almost a completely open chart, like a reflector. And I don't have any awareness centers. I don't have self-awareness or awareness of what my body is um, emotionally feeling or uh, feeling in a more like health way. And so I'm picking up a lot from the world around me. And then I'm able to channel that through if I get out of my own way. And so learning about my authority just gave me so much permission to get out of my own way, to stop judging myself so much and to just show up and be open and express and see what comes through. And the more that I've practiced this and experimented with it, it truly has been the thing, the doorway that's opened up more of my spiritual journey times a million and more of my health journey, more of my emotional journey and more of how I show up for my friends and family and colleagues and customers, et cetera. So I would say hands down using your authority and really understanding and cultivating a relationship with your authority is the most liberating thing you can do because you're liberating yourself. And it's like we talked about on our podcast, it's not something someone else can do for you, right? Like nobody else can live your life for you or can advocate for you or put yourself out there for you. You have to do it yourself. And when you make decisions and make a relationship with your own personal intimate authority, making a relationship with yourself. No one else can do that. And when you do, it creates so much liberation, so much freedom and just being okay in being. And then all the things you want to achieve and do are so much lighter because you're not slugging around this. I'm not okay. Everything's hard. What's wrong with me? Energy that's gone. And so, yeah, I would say cultivating that relationship with your authority. So if you're listening and you're like, okay, I want to, but how there's so many free resources and things out there to start. Our book is a great place. Our podcast is a great place, but there's so many things. So figuring out how you want to dive in, what, whatever way is beautiful, but I encourage you to start. If you're feeling intrigued, start connecting with that part of you 
your authority because it's, it's life changing and truly changed my life in one month. It's beautiful. Well, for those that want to dive in more, we've talked about the book. I'm going to make sure to have the link in our resources section, um, your podcast as well. And then where can people find you on social media? Because I love to ask our guests if there's been any light bulb moments or aha moments or just anything that's come up for them during this conversation. I love for them to screenshot, um, this episode and then tag us both in there and let us know what their biggest takeaway was. So if you can share your Instagram handle so people can find you and do that. Yeah. Our Instagram's at day Luna and our website's daylunalife.com. Our podcast is the day Luna human design podcast, but we would love to see that screenshot. That's so fun. Um, over at day Luna. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for being here and just um, being so articulate and so passionate and so caring with walking us through this, because as you said, this is this is such a a beast of a lifelong journey for people. human design. And so to be able to take it and like conceptualize it and break it out like this is not necessarily easy, which is why you are, you have the gifts that you have and it's why you're doing what you're doing. So thank you so much for being here, breaking this all down so beautifully for us and sharing your wisdom today. 